Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Thank you so much. It's a joy to be here at Holy Blossom, I have, um, and it's a joy to be here um, at a Rabbi Plout's congregation, in addition to many other rabbis. Um, I was on a past president's call with the CCR recently, um, hearing the stories of our past presidents and um, what an incredible chain of tradition that I get to be a part of. And so it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, I noticed when I flew into the airport that Toronto is a little bit obsessed with Taylor Swift recently. Um, at least there's an impact if you're not obsessed. I've been told to stay away from the downtown area this evening. Um, but there is another thing that we are a little bit obsessed with, perhaps some of you might know that next week the movie Wicked is being released in theaters. Okay, I see some nods. So, But if you didn't nod, if you're not quite up on retellings of classic tales that were turned into fantastically successful Broadway musicals and are now coming to the movies genre, I will let you know that Wicked is a retelling of The Wizard of Oz from the point of a view of the Wicked Witch of the West. And the story is beloved by people of all ages, not just for the music, but the message of being true to yourself and the importance of friendship. But the story and the book have also spawned some objections from some parents and some educators who worry that the story is anti-family or glorifies violence or contains, I know this is surprising to all of you, witchcraft. <laughs> And Wicked is one of this long list of books, including The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and I Know Why the Caged Bird, Sing, Bird Sings that people have tried to ban from American schools over the years. In fact, The Wizard of Oz was banned for, I love this, its strong female characters, very dangerous, its use of magic and its attribution of human characteristics to animals. And let's not forget the more recent attempts to ban books that depict LGBTQ families or other, quote, objectionable content. Now, I imagine at this point, you all, the liberal Jewish community here in Canada, is looking with horror upon the American propensity to ban books because, of course, we Jews do not believe in banning books. We believe in the free exchange of ideas. But ironically, we do not entirely practice what we preach because tacitly we do support a de facto ban on parts of a book that is central to who we are, the Torah. Because we read the Torah every week, but we are selective about the parts we choose to read and to study, often treading carefully around texts that we feel are troublesome. And Yashakov to you, Max, for taking on a very troublesome text this morning. I think you are an example to all of us. So thank you for showing us how we can engage with those. Because we have all of these passages in this week's Torah portion that are incredibly troubling and contain some questionable actions by our ancestors. We read that Abraham pretends that Sarah is his sister and she's given to the king as his wife. Abraham, at the urging of Sarah, casts out Hagar into the wilderness with her son Ishmael. And of course, he almost sacrifices his son Isaac. And if we read about this kind of family in the newspaper, we would recoil in horror I know we don't read the newspapers anymore. Whatever social media, you're, I, I still get a newspaper, but that's just me. But here it is, written in the blueprint for our religious and our ethical values. And so when we encounter these troubling passages in the Torah, we ha might have a few reactions. We might want to ignore these texts, because if we don't study them, we don't have to deal with them. Particularly attractive if you're teaching a class of elementary school students and you don't want to delve into these. A second reaction might be we want to minimize or justify those problems in the text. We say they're a product of their time, so we don't really need to think about what they might mean for us today. And the third reaction might be to just read them out of context, to quote them selectively so that we can make the text mean what they want to. But in a very Jewish fashion, surprising to none of you, I'm going to argue for a fourth option, engaging with our texts, even those that make us uncomfortable or that we don't agree with. Because I think this broad engagement is what gives Torah a special place in our lives and our communities, guarding it as a powerful text that continues to influence the way we view the world. And engaging with this difficult text actually gives ourselves and generations to come a gift, the study of our heritage. And so I wanna look at these different modes of engagement briefly. First, I think we have this tendency to ignore these problematic texts. The story of Hagar and Ishmael Casting, being cast out by Sarah is not something we study in depth very often. Because the Torah is a very long book, we don't have time to talk about or study all of it in our Torah study or our services. 
And if we're going to skip passages, we might as well skip those passages about slavery, about stoning a rebellious child, annihilating the inhabitants of the land when we arrived. But I think not studying those does a disservice to us and the text, because the Torah is a whole book. And we need to read the entire thing. Because when we ignore and we sterilize the text, it might be appealing to take those pieces out. But whether a particular piece of the Torah is inspiring or disturbing isn't necessarily inherent in the text itself. It's our interpretation of the passage that is a function of the time and place in which we read it. And so if we take out and cut out those sections of text, in 20 or 30 years, cultural sensitivities will change and we'll either have to take more out or try to put something back in, and then we have made a mess. So I think that we need to not ignore these. We also, and I find myself doing this, justifying or minimizing the problematic portions. We do this most often, I think, with the portions about slavery. When interpreting, interpreting the passage that talks about Hebrew slaves serving for six years and in the seventh year going free, the Eitz Chaim Torah commentary says, this does not refer to the Egyptian model of slavery, a condition of cruel and permanent bondage. It deals with people who find themselves obligated to sell their labor for a fixed time to repay a debt. Whew, thank goodness our slavery wasn't so bad, especially compared to those Egyptians. Moreover, the argument continues, slavery, the idea that slavery is evil is a modern creation. People back then just didn't know that slavery was wrong. But I think justifying this leads us into tenuous territory. If we argue that our ancestors couldn't be expected to understand slavery was wrong, we have to examine why they knew that being enslaved to the Egyptians was wrong. As Frederick Douglass once observed, there is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven who does not know that slavery is wrong for him. And so I think justifying these texts can lead us down the path to fundamentalism where we have to accept everything that we read in the Torah. And I think we do not want to live in a biblical society. And that means that sometimes we have to accept that the Torah got it wrong. A third approach is to read these passages in a way that they were clearly not meant to be read. And to do this, we frequently insist, enlist the support of the rabbis who create wonderful stories that often serve to sanitize the Torah text. You shared one with us this morning, Max. And I think the rabbis are ingenious in this. Another story that happens around the story of the Akedah is that the rabbis imagine that Isaac and Ishmael are arguing about who is more beloved. And Isaac says he would sacrifice his life if God asked him to do so. And this is the reason that Abraham tells him, tells Abraham is told to sacrifice Isaac, right? Not a cruel trick of God, but somehow a show of Isaac's loyalty. I think we should applaud the brilliance of the rabbis. And I think we have to understand that that is not the plain meaning of the text that we get. And we have this tendency to read texts out of passage, even within our own liberal Jewish tradition. Tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. Justice, justice, you shall pursue. Therefore, stop global warming and reform immigration policy and start a war and end a war, right? We can use texts, um, but when we accept them blindly and we don't engage with them, we open the way, door for them to be used in negative ways. I think this all comes from good intentions. We want to defend the Torah so it can be something we believe in. We want to be proud of the legacy we leave the next generation. But we sometimes assume that the sanctity of the Torah requires us to agree with all of it. But it's exactly the opposite. Our texts become more valued when we examine them critically. Through our engagement with the Torah text, we understand that loving a thing does not mean uncritical acceptance. It doesn't we love our country, but we recognize we can question some of its policies. That does not make us less patriotic. It makes us better citizens. And the same is true of our family members. We love our family members not because they are perfect, but because they are family. And similarly with our texts, we can love them, we can respect them, and recognize that they are powerful forces in our lives despite and maybe even because of their flaws. And this gift of looking at all of the text is a gift we can give to future generations. We live in a world that feels increasingly chaotic and scary. We need resilience more than ever. And that resilience lives within our Jewish story. 
I want to end by sharing some research with you with Dr. Marshall Duke and Dr. Robin Fivish of Emory University. They studied resilience in children, and they found that family stories played a large part in children's health and happiness and resilience. And they found something very interesting. Not only is knowing your family story important, but the type of story that your family has is vital. Some families have an ascending narrative, right? We came from nothing, and look at where we are now. Some families have a descending narrative, right? We used to have it all, and look at how hard our lives are. But the families that have an oscillating narrative, a narrative that says, we've had our ups and downs, things have been good and things have been bad, those are the families that build the most resilience. Children know that low points will not last forever, and they appreciate the high points because they know that those two are fleeting. And that is the narrative of our Torah and the narrative of us as a people, an oscillating narrative, a narrative of wonderful moments, the part we read this morning in the Torah of Abraham welcoming guests, right? And arguing for saving the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, the golden age of Spain, the freedoms of the enlightenment period. And we've also had difficult moments. Right? The story of Abraham almost sacrificing Isaac, the Crusades, the Holocaust, and perhaps this moment, I think, is also a moment of difficulty within our Jewish story. But when we study all of the Torah, we teach ourselves and the generations to come that we will be all right. Our ancestors had highs and lows, just as we do. And we are still here, part of a resilient people. And that resilience has to do with the gift of Torah. The Torah that is sacred, not because it is perfect or divine, because of its importance in the history of our people and our own lives and the lives of our children. Because when we were exiled from the land of Israel, the Torah helped to define our collective identity in the diaspora. When we lived as a minority in distant lands, each generation reinterpreted the text, making it relevant for new times. Each new community has contributed layers of thoughts and interpretation and we bring our own interpretation to this generation and give them the gift of our entire text and the message of resilience that the Torah carries. Our Torah is sacred because it is a living document we wrestle with and that we question in each new generation. And this willingness we have to engage, to question, and to challenge even our most sacred text represents the foundation of our Judaism. It is the way we express who we are as Jews it is the legacy that we were given by those who came before us, and it is the legacy we leave for generations to come. So my hope for us this Shabbat is that we continue to wrestle with and to learn from the most sacred of all of our texts, our Torah. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.